when I was very young, in the early 60s, my dad had a car carrying company, automotive transport company called uh, O'Connor Transport. And I vaguely, I thought trucks were cool and cars were cool and that was really neat to me. And I vaguely remember going to a warehouse, a small warehouse that was my dad's other business that was called Contran Distributors, I think it was called. And it had stuff in it that I had no idea what it was. Um, when my dad sold, oh, and, and I think what, happened there was he started he, he always had a love of electronics and sound and, and uh, electricity and he started acquiring some things that I didn't realize until a little bit later what it was when my dad sold his car carrying business he evolved Contran into Starlight equipment and I realized around that time that he had lighting equipment but not lighting equipment like all my friends would know that goes in a house or something like that he had lighting equipment for the film industry uh, which I knew very little about and was still pretty young. Um, then uh, around mid-60s, I think he took me to my first set, and I remember getting on a water taxi at Deep Cove and going up to Wigwam Inn. And I thought that was the set of The Trap, but Bill Thumb tells me that he did a show up there. His first show that he worked on was a thing called The Grudge, I think he told me. Maybe it was The Grove? I'm not sure. It could have been The Grove. Yeah, maybe that's what it was. So I don't know whether I got the titles wrong or whether The Trap shot up there as well. Um, but that was one of my first presentations to film. And I remember at the time there were a lot of English-speaking people, English accents, which I had never heard before as a kid, and I thought that was quite interesting. And I guess subsequent to that, some of the very early projects here were more England-based than L.A.-based. Um, the Trap was one of those, and I remember seeing the stuffed cougar and being up at uh, Panorama Studios in West Vancouver and, and um, seeing the cabin that was built and the whole thing about the fake cougar coming out of the tree was something that went on when I was there very young. Uh, after that, my dad started getting, his business started getting more involved. Um, he bought a building, I think, from the CBC on Capilano Road near Marine Drive. It's still there, and part of that was a studio. Um, there's a soundstage in there, and, and I used to go and play hockey on Saturday mornings, and then after hockey, I'd go to my dad's office, and my job was to refill a pop machine, um, and I'd sort of have the run of the place, and there was a, what I now know is a projection booth and a screening room in there, and I remember crashing around the halls in a very weird dolly that turns out, I found out later, was a television boom uh, dolly for television studios, but at the time, it was this three-wheeled thing that was just very odd for me to, to tow around um, and play things. Um, Bill actually told me that they shot a scene for McCabe and Mrs. Miller in that space, um, which I wasn't aware of. Um, and in around that time, Altman was doing McCabe and Mrs. Miller. My dad was supplying gear to it. Um, I remember being up on that set, and somehow, of course, being a kid, I don't know how it all worked and, and who was invited by whom, but I ended up in a screening room with my dad and Mr. Altman and a few other people who I don't know, and he screened a movie called Brewster McLeod for us, which, now knowing what I know, I realized it was a film he had done before that, and he had started his next movie, but was still, I guess, doing the final polishes on Brewster McLeod. Very few people know that movie, but I was thoroughly entertained by it. I thought it was great. Um, How was this man, Robert Altman? I don't remember him, other than being a... a, a gentleman of presence that everybody deferred to. I mean, I was, I was nine or ten, I guess. So all I saw was a fellow who seemed to have an aura about him that resulted in even at a young age, I could tell, was respect. Beyond yes or no, sir. Uh, you know, as, as a kid, everybody's Mr. Such and Such. But there seemed to be, um, I don't know, it just seemed like everybody in the room had a lot of respect for him. Um, and, and I, I, I don't remember much other than that. I, I mean, he didn't, he didn't talk to us afterwards or anything like that. I think it was just I happened to be there at a, at a moment in time when, when he was screening a movie that he had done. Well, even to get invited to a screening, that's amazing. I don't even, again, I have no idea how my dad ended up with that, other than I knew he was supplying equipment to the show, to McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Um, but other than that, I, I don't really know how it came about. And... It was a long time before I realized how special it was. Justice Green was one of the guys that worked for my dad and I think worked running that generator. Um, 
Frank Parker is another guy that I remember that worked for Dad at that stage running the generator. Um, a lot of people who worked for Dad over the years have gone on to th other things. Steve Jackson is a DP uh, on TV, and he worked for Dad. Um, George Urshbaumer has been directing for the last 20 years. After he left Dad, he went into special effects and, and became a director. Fred Boyd worked for Dad, and, and he became a very uh, well-known gaffer in town. Uh, it, it was kind of a bit of a training grounds for a lot of people to jump into the industry from. I know definitively what happened. My dad was undercapitalized, and as a result, quite frankly, he didn't do as good a job as that he would like to have done in supporting films, and they went in search of somebody who could do it better. And White's in Toronto was much more established and sent out a couple of containers out here and did it well enough that they kept selling, sending out more containers of stuff. And what happened with my dad uh, was that he kind of segued through different markets. So um, he got involved in theatrical lighting, and then he got involved in nightclub lighting. So he kind of... Um, moved through some different areas as opposed to concentrating on one thing. Uh, and he was very good at being at the forefront of things. Like he was involved in the nightclub industry uh, supplying lighting before anybody else got involved. But then other people would came in and specialize in that and then he'd move on to something else. And he kind of ended up doing a little bit of everything. Um, again, as a kid, I remember people and, and meeting people at the shop would come in who would be doing commercials. But there wasn't full-time work in that industry. They were, they were doing commercials. They were maybe getting a feature film part of the year. They are doing whatever they could to, to not have to have another uh, full-time job, but they would have a lot of part-time jobs to, to make it go. I remember, I think it was, I think KVOS TV had a studio on Burrard Street near the Burrard Street Bridge that I remember Dad taking equipment to, and they would shoot commercials in there sometimes. Um, and people like, Bill Newberry, who was a gaffer, would come in and get stuff, and, and Fred Ransom was another fellow that I remember as, as a young fellow when they would come in and get stuff from Dad when they were going off and doing their independent things or whatever they could get to, to make ends meet. Yeah, it, my um, evolution in the industry is a little bit unusual in that I never had that bug thinking, man, I really want to work in the film industry. Um, I had the opportunity to. I, the first time I worked on set, I think I've told you this story before, uh, I think it may have been John Bartley who was the business agent at the time at IATSE and uh, he called my dad and asked if I was available. They needed somebody who was strong and, and could do some work and uh, knew a little bit about lights because I did from having them in the shop and I got taken to a set and told, do what you're told, don't tell anybody how old you are. <laughs> what set was this? Do you, you know, I've been trying and trying to remember and I cannot remember. Um, I think it, it might have been a George C. Scott movie called The Changeling, but it might have been earlier than that. Really? Yeah, yeah. So it was that was a, an interesting introduction to me, and then I ended up working um, sort of in in lighting in if in different areas because of Dad's connections. While I finished high school and, and went off to university, I'd come home in the summertime and I'd work on concerts for IATSE in the lighting department. I worked at BCTV in its um, I guess not early years, because I think it was probably the early 70s by the time I was working at BCTV a little bit. Um, What's your degree, by the way? Uh, my first one's in business, and then I, I, I got my bachelor's degree in business and came home and started working on sets and doing things again, And because um, th financially it was quite good. I ended up actually working at Panorama Studios on Let's Make a Deal um, so while I was going to university, so I spent some time back there sort of 15 years after first being there. Um, after I got my uh, my bachelor's degree, I went back to work because I was asked if I would work at BCTV, and I did that for a while. And then I went back to school to get my master's degree in business. And when I came home from that, literally within a day or two of arriving home, Fred Boyd called me and said, are you interested in coming out and working on set? And I wasn't doing anything else. So I said, sure, I'll come out and help out. And by that time, the industry had grown quite a bit. Uh, that would have been 84, I guess. Um, and uh, so I worked on set for a while, and, and about after about 10 months of that, I thought, okay, I got I to do something else. And I applied to MBA schools and went off to do my MBA. Uh, 